Welcome back to the Meaningful People podcast. How are you, dude? How are, oh, how, that's exactly what it sounds like. How are you, dude? Is it though? Is it really though, dude? How are you, dude? Uh, someone came over to me actually the other week. They're like, "How are you, dude?" I'm like, "Good." And they're like, "You know, you see what I'm. How are you, dude? You see what I'm doing?" I'm like, "What are you doing?" They're like, <laughs> "I'm doing what like Momo does." I'm like, "Oh, uh, how are you, dude?" <laughs> I'm Baruch Hashem. I'm good. Good. And we got a special, special episode of Meaningful People to speak with Rifki Morel. A story of resilience, a story of love, yes. a story of hope, a story that is so apropos for this time of year. Yeah. Whenever you're listening to it, honestly, you know, it's a story of, of, uh, of how she lived and continues to live her life, borrow time, which is on with a new pair of lungs, um, having been a recipient of a lung transplant, battling CF and... And being married to Alti Morel of Shalom, who is a tzaddik of a guy. What a yid. What a hill Who was uh, on his second heart as well. And unfortunately passed away a little over a year ago. The name she of this really, she really, I think she changes the the paradigm where it's not, it's not an enduring challenge as much as it is just thriving yeah. within the challenge. It really is. It, you know, you're absolutely right with that. And um, name of this episode is, again, two hearts, two lungs, one soul. Mm. That's like their thing. Love two it. hearts, two lungs, one soul. Love and that's it. who they were. So hope it. you enjoy this episode. First, we have a quick message from our friends at Blue Glove Concierge. How are you, dude? They, by the way, have this really nice urgent care in North Woodmere. Yes, did, they do. Did, Momo, did you know about that? Oh, did I know about it? Did you? I am a frequent visitor of this particular urgent care. Thank okay. you so much, Adina. Um, besides for my wife and six children having that available to them but i personally benefited from this particular urgent care the second time that i had covid um adina helped me personally get the monoclonal antibody oh, infusion wow. on matza simchas Tyra. i was actually in really really rough shape um i don't know if you remember this adina but i was like out for the count and she was aware of a, an infusion center that was opening literally that night. Amazing. And she called a guy and she's like, I have someone that's on the way. And people were trying to get appointments in hospitals. And it was like a whole Indian because there were like two days of yumptive. People were backed up and trying to get spots. And people were staying in the hospital all night to get their infusion. And blue glove. That's what concierge. they do. So people got me right in. You got to know all sick visits, adults, kids, six months and up. They have experience, do flu shots, blood work, also do house calls. But you know what I want to talk about specifically? Something that I got done with them recently. Which Interesting. Is they're blue drips. Interesting. Blue drips concierge. Now, what are those drips? I got a multivitamin IV on a random Tuesday. Good for you. And dude. I was like, I wasn't feeling so good. Maybe I was coming off of like a little bit of a sniffle and I was nauseous, whatever. They gave me this multivitamin drip, IV. It came to my house, in my arm, and I literally walked away feeling like incredible. Wow. I felt like Hulk. So give them a call. Their number is 917-334-4134. And they come One to you. One more time, a little bit more slowly, Naki. 917-334-4134. Guys, quality, efficient. Guys and gals. Guys and gals. Quality, efficient care, bougie service. Quality, efficient care. That's Blue Glove Concierge. Reach out to them. Whether you need to go see their urgent care or you want to get those drips, you know, you could be pregnant and nauseous or just not feeling well. Those drips are for you. Quality, efficient care. Enjoy this episode. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Rifki Morel. Welcome. Yes, this is, uh, I'm very excited about this episode. I'm saying that in front of you because, you know, we do a lot of episodes with Baruch Hashem, a lot of superstars that are well-known, big names, everyone knows them, they see them on the street, they run to get a selfie. And I'm very excited about this episode because, you know what, you're somebody that could be walking in the street and... Many people might not know your story or who you are, and I think you're one of the hidden gems, not just in the five towns, but in Kalal Yisrael, so I'm very excited to be recording this episode with you, and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. This is a very big honor, so thank you for the opportunity. 
of course, of course. So how about, you know, we jump right in. First, I want to say, you know, we're going to discuss about your life, um, you know, battling cystic fibrosis, really thriving with it, and uh, the life that you led with, with Alti Morel, Al Vashalem. Ironically, I lived in the same building as Rifki and Alti for the first, wow. I think, two years of my marriage. Um, didn't realize the people who, who I was in the building with, they're amazing people, but I got to know Alti a little bit. Um, and he was just, you know, an amazing, amazing person. I'm, I'm very excited to discuss, you know, his life with you. But take us back, I guess, a little bit um, to growing up with cystic fibrosis, you know, a disease that really um, dictated what you could and couldn't do a lot in your life. I guess let's talk about that a bit. So it mainly impacts the lungs and the digestive system. I had a pretty mild growing up, and no one knew that I had it. I hid it very well, and I wanted to be like everyone else. And because it was mild, it was easy to hide. I did have to do preventative uh, nebulizing, and I had a machine that I had to use at night. So my lungs were full of mucus, and I had to use a machine that would shake me a little so I could loosen the secretions. But I really went to school regularly. I didn't really do sleepovers. Did you go to TAG? I did. Nice. TAG, shout out. My uh, wife and I have three daughters in TAG. Do you know? So we love TAG, yeah. Okay. We found the common ground. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Um, and... Really, the only thing I didn't do that I felt that my friends did was sleepaway camp. I was more quiet because I was always nervous that we would get into a conversation that I would have to fumble to make something up. Right. So I, I kept to myself. I had friends, but just I wasn't so loud. It must have been a lot to... To sort of carry, like that secret of living with with that. It was, but you get used to whatever you have. And like, this was my life. So I didn't really think twice. And it was just something that I did. And the trade-off was that I was like everyone else on the right. outside. So, And then... I. It came to some point, I imagine, that it was not something that could be hit anymore. Right. So I was in towards the end of high school, and it started. It's, I started coming to terms with the fact that this was a very serious disease. I was a little bit in denial, and then I just started getting um, the pattern change. Like, it used to be that if I would get an infection, I would go get it treated. And then a few weeks later, I was back to my baseline. But it started not going that way. And I would say around 12th grade is when it really uh, got worse. Um, but that year, everybody was getting ready for seminary, and very busy with themselves. So I didn't really, I didn't tell anyone. I was used to not telling anyone. And when they were all applying to seminaries, I was actually applying to a different hospital because I was part of a center that was pediatrics. And the doctor was also not sh so sure what to do with me. So she told me I have to find a more uh, complex like right. hospital that deals with, you know, not the typical CF patient. So I was getting into the medical world when they were all oh. getting into the fun and, you know, yay, we're finishing high school. And I was starting a very nerve-wracking and scary process. Wow. 
I, I want to stop you there and just pause for a moment. This is a, a point that I think has come up a few times in, in recent episodes, but the, the point is just very vivid as you're illustrating what you were going through in 12th grade, how we never know what people are going through unless it's on the surface. And in your case, there was a lot that was not on the surface. And like you mentioned, people are applying to seminaries while you're applying to diff- a different hospital. And just invite, I just want to invite some sensitivity into the room um, to our listeners where you might be dealing with something that's very exciting for you and you might be dealing with something that's, you know, very technical. And let's just invite a little bit of sensitivity into when you share that with someone and when you, you know, when you bring that up to someone, you really never know what's going on in their life. Right. It's, well, there, you know, a lot of people have medical conditions. Mine, you can't tell from the outside. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's a good example for anyone. Um, Like if you see someone using a handicap spot, let's say, and you're like, they don't look handicapped. And really you have no idea because it's not always outwards. So I think of it like that. You know, when yeah. you when when you said when you were just saying about you know twelfth grade everyone was applying for seminary and you were applying for hospitals, I sort of like uh, I felt the pain in your voice about that moment. It's almost as if you were reliving it in, reliving it in your head. Um, it's hard for it's hard for me, and I imagine it's hard for you as well, Momo. Anyone who didn't go through that to understand that feeling in that moment of why can't I just you know. Why can't they just be like them? Why can't they just apply? Why can't I just go to seminary? Why can't I just, was, was that what you were feeling at the moment? Well, that I think was the turning point when I really, it became very apparent that I was not following in everybody's path, you know, yeah. and being different. And it was for sure, I think I was just used to being different and, I don't know if I questioned it so much because I was dealing with that a lot. Just, okay, it's not what is meant for me. And it, I wasn't as mature, obviously. Right. So there was some, some, you know, upset feelings. But I was also very nervous to even take, you know, if I really wanted it. But I was just, I think, um, given this really tough news at that time that I just couldn't see past it. And I think it was so foreign to me to even say, oh, I want to go to seminary. You know, it was just so, um, I was in shock that it was happening. Meaning the, the, how it was progressing. Yeah, I... I had an older sister who passed away at that time a year and a half ago. I was in high school, and she had cystic fibrosis. So she was the only person that I had to look up to that had the same thing as me. But I was always under the, you know, oh, it's not going to happen to me because I was not sick for so long. And that was just when I realized that, oh, we do, it is the same thing, and it's just hitting me later. It's such a, it's such a hard thing to grapple with, to be, you know, mourning the loss of your sister, but to also be scared and fearful of what your future holds, because of, you know, you shared that, you had that similarity in terms of that, what you were fighting. It it was so hard. I mean, it, it, It only got worse because as I went to the hospital and the, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but I was actually the same age when I was waiting for a transplant and that she was waiting for a transplant and she didn't make it. So I really was, was, I can't have the same way that her story ended like it can't be that way because 
It was so similar. Yeah. Wow. You had mentioned to me um, when we spoke briefly last week on the phone that in that moment, sort of waiting for that transplant and you were very sick at the time, you were thinking you have so much more life left to live and you want people to like know you and know your story. So yeah, then, um, so after uh, 12th grade, I went to Boston. They have, I had only known the CF floor as a very small, you know, in and out. Like I hadn't been there so long. And I got to Boston and there's a whole floor of cystic fibrosis. I was, you know, just so surprised by the amount of patients and how but the way they do it is so um you each cf patient they're not contagious to anyone else except someone that has cystic fibrosis they made a movie about that recently right called five feet apart Wow. So the germs from one person. No, I didn't want someone told me. I yeah, was learning and I, someone said there's yeah. a movie. And I was like, what? Right. So there's, um, you can, there's certain germs that are right. dangerous for other CF patients. So I had to always be in the room. And then if anyone wanted to go out, like for a walk or to get fresh air. They, like, take turns? You have to tell the nurse, and then they make sure no one else is out. It's like wow. COVID. So it was, like, a whole for, world yeah. there that I, you know, I... Uh, well, I'm n- not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so th- I got there. I was 19, and I thought, like, I'm coming. They're going to give me what I need. And, yeah, it could be, like... They said, it's going to be a longer stay. I'm a new patient. And I said, whatever it is, I'll be here a few weeks, and then I could just resume my life, which at that point wasn't really much. But um, I was there for the first day was three weeks, but I didn't realize that it was the first day. And after that point, I kept having to go back. They would say... Um, I was better, I would go home, and then I would end up getting an infection. Like, I would get fever, um, have a very bad cough, and then they would tell me to come back. So this was going on for, I would say, like two years of going back and forth. And my life became really split to the point where it just kept being more time in Boston than home. Right. It was very isolating. And at that point, my, the disease was progressing. Mm-hmm. So I was losing more of the ability to do like regular things. It was a slow, slow process. I sure. didn't realize how much. Then on one of my trips back, I went... I think I was actually at a doctor in New York, and she said that I needed oxygen. And And you said to her, we all need oxygen. I couldn't believe that this was, again, like what I was used to, like my sister was on oxygen. Right. So it became like a symbol, the first symbol for me that it was an outward thing, because before no one could tell anything was wrong. That was a very big blow to me like oh now I have to carry this around Mm -hmm. and if also like all you know I haven't really been out but now they see me with oxygen and they didn't even know anything was wrong I just I didn't like to be out so much with it which meant that I couldn't really be out but at that point also I didn't have very much energy left and I'm wondering, you mentioned that it was an isolating feeling. And it's. I can think of this in, in three phases. Sort of the elementary school, high school phase where you're on your own choice, you know, sort of avoiding interactions so that it doesn't come up, like you mentioned, in conversation. Then there's this escalation where everyone goes off to seminary and you're, you know, addressing the disease in Boston over over those two years. And then there's this third stage 
where you're introducing this element of oxygen and it's sort of out there in the open. What I'm curious, what resources, if any, or what people in your life that were aware of it in the first phase and maybe in the second phase before it became out in the open, were there people in your life that were there for you that were aware of it that you were able to connect to? So I, I my my circle was very small. Um, I did have a few friends, but even my best friend, I never told her straight out, like, oh, I have this and this. And when I told her, I, I was in Boston, and she said, like, do you think I never picked up on it? We did not have Google, and until, like, maybe then it had just come out. But it was much harder. Like, now you Google three symptoms, and you know what that person has. Everyone's a doctor, yeah. But... Um, your friends know you, even if you don't. And she said, I never asked you because I figured you wanted privacy. And but she picked up on a few things. And People are today very good diagnosticians. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, too good. I always compliment my wife. She always knows exactly what is going on. And she gives a lot of credit to Google as well. It's Yiddish but Shimano, I though. think she's a really good diagnostician. That's, that's how it works. Your wife's a doctor, well, no? She's not a doctor? <laughs> She's more of a Google user than a doctor. Oh. Hertz makes a mean, good at it. mean chicken soup. Nice. I also didn't want to be seen. Right. So it was like, I was so used to being private about it that I felt like I can't just go parading around. Because it was something that I wanted. I had just become, you know, it was something that went along with it. Like, oh, it's, it's something that's my secret. Even though at that point, like, did it really matter? It was just something that I was... I didn't know how to, all you know, start calling someone up and say, "Oh, do you remember?" You know, it was just like, "Oh, no one knows about it besides these two or three people," and that's what it was. But it was so isolating because also I was in Boston. There's not like I did have one friend who. This was a little bit later on. I was in Boston. Till I got my transplant at 23. So from 19 to 23, you were in Boston. In and out, but yeah. the later years, it was much more time in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend whose husband was in Harvard, and I'm like, Hashem made him go to Harvard just to have... She was so bored. It's a mad flex also. And she, she would <laughs> right? come visit me every day, so that was really so helpful. That was like probably She was your friend before year. her husband yeah. went to school. Thank God she married someone smart. Right? Yeah, and and then just hospitals are very isolating, and especially then when there w there wasn't really social media. Right, it was like it was out, but it wasn't like it is today. This was twelve years ago. Right, different world. Well, <laughs> over the course of like yeah. So it's um y you're. Getting, you know, you're 23 years old and you're sort of realizing and your doctors are realizing that this is not, you need a transplant. Okay, so the the doctor came in one morning and I guess I was like, I was very used to this pattern of just not really moving and having setbacks and I didn't really think of, like, how am I getting out of this? The doctor came in, and he, I remember him saying the word transplant and helicopter, and I'm like, they're talking about me? And, yeah, I was in denial. And he said, it's, you have to decide if this is something you want because it's very, it's a very hard process. I thought he was crazy. Like, why is he asking me if I want it? I'm like, I ha this is my one way out. Like, why wouldn't I? Yeah. But he said it's it's very tough and you have to be able to go through it. If it's, we go through the part of, you know, looking for the lung, then you have to be willing to give it your all and do this. But the minute he said that, all of a sudden I had hope that it's going to happen and I'm going to do it. And I don't care how hard it is, but it just had, uh, I had something to... Look forward to. Yeah, to 
you know, to move towards. I think that's remarkable. You know, uh, people, Nahi mentioned that we can't fathom what it's like to endure a challenge like this. And just getting to listen to you talk and to see how how pushing it is to you that when there's this way out, of course I'm going to have the resilience. Of course I'm going to have the, you know, the fortitude to forge through this this type of challenge. Where do you think that came from? That that just unadulterated will to live and to fight. So what are, something that I did in the hospital that I think changed my whole attitude and how I got through it. There was a lot of doom and gloom, and it was a lot of the same, and looking outside the window, and everybody's able to walk and run, and I'm just sitting here. I could barely walk down the hall, and I didn't like that going to bed feeling like this, you know, and this fear, and will I, will something change, and watching my body even, you know, lose the ability to do things, So one night I took out a post-it note and I said, I'm going to write down something that happened to me today that was good. And I hung it up next to my bed and I decided I'm doing this every day. I was there so long that the walls were covered and the doctors would come in and read them and it was very colorful. (laughs) And like they were, they just love coming into my room but what what that did for me was, first of all, it showed me that there's there's so much bad, but there's no matter how much bad you could find something to be thankful for. The the post-its I wrote, no one would believe that that's something to even think about. But I wrote, I sat in a chair, um, I was able to walk down the hall, I took a shower that did not happen often I didn't have energy or the permission like things that we don't even think about I realized that there were such big things because when you got strips of so much you realize how much you had wow. and then it also made me realize that Hashem didn't forget about me if he did this little chesed for me that day And it also gave me some sort of goal. Like, every day, I don't care. I'm going to write something. So I think that's You look for it more. Yeah, like it got me to do... Like, also, when you do something every day, you you have to continue. Like, I would feel bad if I forgot to hang up a note that night. Like, it became a thing. Yeah. So... It's so amazing. I think it just made me have that attitude of, I'm going to do it. Because even if... There's nothing good here. I'm going to find something good. We got to normalize that. I, yeah. I think we're about to start a trend. Maybe it's maybe people do it already, but like, watch out. Variety down there. Your post-it note's about to get <laughs> sold <laughs> out, right? Whoever you know, whoever did those those masks and you know PPE stuff during COVID, yeah, invest in post-it notes. <laughs> folks, feel free to hold Nahi to it. This whole studio <laughs> yes. is, for those that are watching, is glass windows. If you don't see post-it notes... Oh my popping gosh. up on the glass uh, windows, feel free to let Nahi know about that. I think I'd have to go outside and put it on the outside. No, erroneous. No, right here. But then only I see it on the inside. You're saying, ah, uh, okay, I got you. Okay, we'll give it a shout. I was worried I had to climb the building. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, that's amazing. That's really amazing. I think I saw a picture of that somewhere of those post-it notes. Yeah. So when I was leaving, um, my husband. mother was with <laughs> me the whole time. Yeah. So when I was leaving for the transplant, like they said the the ambulance is here like I had to run out but I told my mother take down every post-it note and keep them because when life gets back to normal people forget about the things that they were davening for and and what was so big to them when everything's fine but I would never want it to forget those how those little things were so big it's like the joke they say about someone looking for a parking spot you know that joke where someone's like desperately looking for a parking spot. Obviously in Gorman Glass parking lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the person's like, oh, Hashem, please, please let me find a parking spot. I'm going to be late and I'm going to miss it. It's a job interview, whatever the drama around it is. You're like, you really, really need the spot. 
And then like all of a sudden, right in front of the destination, it like opens up. And the person's like, oh, forget it, forget it, I found one. <laughs> like you forget what you're davening for. Yeah. Right, because when, when life is easy, it's much, it's hard to, you know. Put yourself in that mode yeah, of thinking to, about it. Yeah, like, oh, it's so great that I had this little thing that day. Like, it becomes, it's natural, it is. And it's hard to be thankful for every single thing all day. But I, I had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. Mm. We'll be right back. Right back. We'll be right back to this episode of Meaningful People. You know, we're in this story right now about Rifkin Morell and so much of this medical journey. A lot of people get their medical career started. You know where? At Turo University. So, you know, Rifkin endured so many doctors, so many heroes who were helping her along the way with care, with sensitivity, and just being for there. You ever think about getting into that path of maybe going to medical school and making a difference in that field? Look no further than Turo University. Turo University. So you should really go ahead and head to turo.edu forward slash more. Because if you're thinking, hey, you know what? It's funny. Alti's, Alti Morel's mother, who Rifki was married to, had a passion for, for medical care, having dealt with Alti so much. And when she was 42 years old, she went to medical school. Really? She became a doctor. That's wild. And towards the end of Alti's life, she really cared for him. But now I think she has her own practice in Narratus Earl, and she's a doctor. That's Vild. That's Vild. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you got going on in life. Head to turo.edu forward slash more to see where they can take you. And while you're doing that, you might think, hey, I want to go to medical school, but how am I going to pay for it if my credit is out of whack? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> right? Interesting. So while you're heading to turo.edu forward slash more, you open up the second tab. And you, you go ahead and, oh, that's erroneous. Oh, and you go ahead and you, oh. che and you check out Bridge Credit Solutions. Bridge Credit Solutions. Oh, Sorry, I'm getting a phone call as we speak. It's back. You know who's calling? Your wife? Bridge Credit <laughs> Solutions. <laughs> so that's Bridge Credit Solutions. They can fix your credit from not so good to very good. So go ahead and hit the link in the description. Hit the link in the show notes and get in touch with the people that will fix your credit. Which people? Bridge Credit Solutions. Now back to this episode. What was the, you know, as you're preparing for that transplant, um, you mentioned they threw words like helicopter, transplant. Very, it sounds very scary. What was the risk, you know, that the doctors told you about going into this situation, about the transplant? Ultimately, what they were doing is they were taking out the lungs that you had, that you were born with, and they were giving you new lungs. Right. So there are different programs, but very few in the country. And there's a whole way how system how it works. You have to be able to get to the hospital in, I think it was five hours. Um, and they they have to be perfect. They won't know if the lungs are good till they actually go to the patient and check them out. Meanwhile, I would ha be ha starting to go there in case they were. But before the transplant, I would have to be accepted into a program. And some hospitals are very picky about the people they take because they're worried about their statistics. and They want success rates. Right. So I was turned down, but I did go. I wanted to double my, my chances. So I did um, two hospitals that were kind of equidistance by by um, Medivac is it's a medical right. plane. And um, I had gone in the summer, like when they told me that I needed a transplant that summer, I flew to different hospitals and they I took so many tests, but very, very extensive and scary. And seeing how much you know, take away my oxygen, how long I could breathe for. I was, it was really intense. And finally I got accepted to two, but um, they both said I have to be very, very fit because this transplant, not everybody makes it. The body has to be, um, not realize that the lungs don't belong to you because then they will attack it. So, um, I went to pulmonary rehab that summer, which is um, exercise, but done under doctors and 
um, physical therapist that attached me to monitors to make sure my heart rate wasn't too fast. And I'm on oxygen, so it's like they have to make me work, but not work that I can't breathe. Um, Just so my muscles are strong enough for after the transplant. I did get accepted to Columbia here and Pittsburgh. And I got the acceptance Accepted in August of 2009. That acceptance, was that, that come as a shock to you or? Well, because not every place is willing to accept me. Um, it was just uh, another step that this is going to happen for me. Yeah. Because I had somewhere to go. So you got those, those post-it notes in tow, in tow. You're on the way to the hospital. You're on the helicopter plane okay this is a crazy story so first the ambulance comes i first got a fake one it's called a uh dry run and i was ready to go then they said oh forget it the lungs aren't good so the next time i wasn't sure if it would work oh you didn't know that it was a was they, it a they don't tell me to it was a drill me. or no like they got someone an attempt. They, there's a, oh. everything has to match up the the blood type um, also the, the lungs are the hardest organ to do a transplant on because all the other organs are c- sealed off in the body, but the lungs are open to air. So most of the time, if there's a patient that's in a coma or some sort of machine, a lot of times they get pneumonia or, so it's not Because of so how exposed likely. the lungs are. Right. So... They had a call that there was a pair, so I got excited, and then they said in the end it wasn't good. So I was scared to get excited again. Right. But um, they called the ambulance. I I think that element is worth zeroing in on as well because people, I've seen this uh, from people in my life that are enduring medical challenges. It is difficult to get excited even when there's a positive indication because People are afraid to let themselves down. And right. can you just elaborate on that particular dynamic, like the the fear of even getting excited when a positive development occurs? Well, I think that I was so used to hearing uh, bad things. And even when they said, oh, things look good, and then the next day they weren't looking good, then you put up a, you know, a, a shield and... Mm-hmm. You don't want to celebrate any little thing. At the sa- yeah, yes, you have to be thankful, but you could have different feelings at the same time. And yeah, you're thankful for the little thing that you know the uh, the medicine, the pain medicine worked that day, but also that they said bad news and. I I guess I just got too used to the good news not lasting, so I just became, um, you know, I put up, I put my guard up. So. Yeah, sure. So what was what was the you know take us through the moments I guess of the, the, the transplant, transplant and following that. So they so I I go into the ambulance, then they put me on a plane, and I land in. Columbia. So first my thought was, oh, I'm finally local and people could come to me. And you're back in New York. Yeah, but that didn't last long. So I finally get there. So there's a lot of prep for the surgery. And when I get there, the the doctors, whoever was doing tests, they looked at me and said, oh, this, you are not going through this today. And you're too sick. I think I had fever. And I I remember being on the plane and just really not breathing very well. And my body was moving with each breath. And I made sure not to fall asleep because I was like, I have to see where it ends. And I didn't want to fall asleep and not know how the story ended. So, but I get there and I'm finally like about to be calm. Like, hey, I wanted to know I did the most that I could to get to that point. 
and you know let Hashem do the rest. So I get there, and they they're like, "Oh, we are not doing this on you." And I remember, like, my parents were there, and they the the doctor said, "Well, put we'll put her on the side, and like hopefully she'll get better." And she'll be well enough to do surgery the next time there's a pair of lungs. First of all, that does not happen often. And I had made it so far. So I always say it's like when you're running a marathon and you finally get to the finish line and they're like, sorry, Mm. you have to keep going. And you just have nothing left. So at that point, I was really, I didn't have a lot of hope left. Because what would happen to me now? Like, um, I Just, got here. Right. So they put me on the side. This was on a Thursday. And I was, like, in and out. Then um, Shabbos morning, my mother was next to me. And her phone was ringing. So she's like, wait, it's Shabbos. Who's calling me? We're already in the hospital. But she saw that it was Pittsburgh. So she picked up, and it was the surgeon himself, and he said, we have lungs also. So my mother has said, oh, here we're here, and they, they think that she's too sick for this. Um, but I, I don't know how, because I wasn't really so alive at that point. I said, we are going. I, again, I said, there's a chance. We're taking that chance. I want to know I did everything. And they don't seem to really be, there's nothing to do at this point. So um, she, she said, okay, we're coming. She told the surgeon. Then they put me back onto another ambulance to another medivac to Pittsburgh. I did not know where I was at that point because I was, I kept being transferred, but I know I got to Pittsburgh sometime on Chavez and they were prepping me. I remember that I was, I felt like I really, my ending was, was very close because I, I just kept saying, could you do it already? Could you do it already? I didn't think I would make it. And they said, yeah, it takes long. The lungs have to come. And we called my family. They still thought I was in New York. So this was Slichos night also. Wow. So everyone was like... Which is this the, Matzah Shabbos. As we record this, yeah. 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 And it's so everyone was, um, was davening. And I remember falling off the bed. Like I had to hold myself on because the, it was so hard for me to breathe. My body was really you know, moving with every breath. And then the surgeon finally came in, and I remember saying, do it already. And he said, okay, you're going to have to do everything I say afterwards. It's going to be very hard. I'm like, I don't care. And I went in, and I said, that's it. Like, Hashem does the rest. If it's if it works, then I just had to know that I did the most that I could. During the night of Slichus. Yeah. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachem, Vachan, and Mamash. Wow. And you woke up. So I woke up on, I, re, I researched so much. I'm like, <laughs> I knew which, if I wake up, then this is how it's going to look. So I'll know that it happened. I remember that my mother like pointed and said her cheeks are pink. I was gray before. So I was like, oh, that means it worked. But... When a person wakes up, they don't feel well. So it's not like, oh, yay, I could go live mm. life. Not climbing Mount Everest. No, yeah. it's it's a different pain. It, like, changed to a physical, crazy, sharp pain that before it was painful to breathe. But So it didn't, like, hit me really. Oh, I feel like, you know, it was a, such a long process. Like being born again. Really, I, I could not do anything. And I made a, a list on my wall that said all my miracles. And then the first day that I sat up and the first day that I that I walked, and they also said I was not allowed to eat anything for 
or not even eat. They said you cannot put even an ice chip in her mouth. Wow. For two weeks. Oh my god. Because they were scared that I, that I would aspirate. Right. Um, it was actually over Rosh Hashanah, so like they brought in all this food for my mother, and I remember like, hey, this is like I'm listening to the surgeon, and this is what I at you know he asked me to do, and I'm gonna do it, and they would make me walk the halls with with tubes coming out of me, and my mouth was so dry, but I was like, no, like I'm gonna do this. I made it so far, and that's how I got through that the first few weeks and then it became like okay like i feel that maybe this was a good thing <laughs> wow <laughs> you know that it like i felt better mm -hmm. i just want to adjust if you could just bring it down i don't want it to block your face too much there yeah oh nice perfect i think it's incredible too the way the way you're sharing the story and, and realizing how on the calendar it occurred right before rosh hashanah is when you got your new lungs and you also shared that that feeling of running the marathon and you're there at the finish line. And it just hit me as you were saying both of those things that, you know, we believe that things that happen to us over the course of the year are determined on Rosh Hashanah and sealed on Yom Kippur. And you got your lungs right before the next Rosh Hashanah, which means that the Rosh Hashanah that preceded that Almost a full year ago, Hashem decided for you that you were going to get those lungs. And all you had to do was run that marathon for the entire year and not not bow out of the of the race, or not the race, but the marathon right before the finish line. It's it's incredible. It's funny you say marathon because I I had no I know it's like it is a good example, but like a year before that. I would wake up with so little energy and I would have to calculate what to use my energy on to the point where when I went for pulmonary rehab, I had to buy sneakers that didn't have laces because if I bent down to tie my shoes, I would need to take a nap. I would get into a coughing fit. So it's like, look at one year, what a difference it was. Wow, wow. So, Rifki, you're 23 years old, you got new lungs, and you're thinking, hey, a lot of my friends are dating, a lot of my friends are getting married. Did you think for a second, hey, is this in the books for me? Am I, is this in the cards? Like, So, I mean, till I really got out of the whole transplant yeah. thing, that there was, it was a while. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that, different medical problems that come up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually never thought I would get married because I felt that Hashem had done enough for me. Like, hey, he saved me. I don't need a, I don't need any more from him. Like he, he did. He showed me that he saved me, and like, of course, that it was something I wanted. But I just, I would, I would be okay if it didn't happen. That's how I felt. And um, my. I was actually very good friends with Alter, who was her cousin. Right. And I actually had gotten a lot of calls about him because transplant and transplant. So he had two heart transplants. And it was amazing to know each other so well like we like we were talking like which drugs are you on <laughs> and how like what was your recovery and it was like i couldn't believe someone could understand me so well wow and we turned um like we would play games um with our pillbox like mancala and like <laughs> it was so his he just liked to That's everything awesome. was positive for him and just such a he had a way that like, every hour he's alive, he's going to celebrate just because we don't have to have a reason. What do you mean? We're alive. Let's wow. go. Like, enjoy it. Gewalt. And he taught me how to, how to do that and how to have fun. And I was also, I guess, because I was sick, I was more nervous about doing things than I 
I always played it safe. Right. And he was like, no, you, we could go on a p- traveling and it's okay. It will work out. And, and he showed me that that's true. Wow. I want to, before we unpack your relationship with, with yeah. Alter for, for a minute, I want to, I want to zero in on something else that you said and, and really offer it to, to everyone in, in this system of Shaduchim that we've embraced for ourselves in the from community, I think a lot revolves around projecting a certain image that everything is great and everything is wonderful and it's identifying everyone's myla and and that's that's great, that's wonderful. But what I heard you share is how you were able to connect with someone not on how everything is awesome, but through things that were your challenges and how you related to each other in the challenges that you had to endure and that's what brought you so close that that's the level on which you connected it's like that vulnerability yeah exactly and I, I feel like everyone can benefit from that and instead of looking for someone where everything is awesome try to know one's own defect because everyone is imperfect that that's yeah. a reality and to find someone whose myla complements your imperfection and to find someone who might be faced with a similar challenge as you are and that you can connect with that person through that. It's such a beautiful way to approach Shaduchim. So interesting. Maybe people do that. Like, hey, I'm Nachi, and I got rejected from three <laughs> medical schools. Like, <laughs> it was only three. It wasn't more than three. <laughs> Harvard called, but oh, whatever. Didn't want to leave home. <laughs> well, I know Boston. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I felt that. I don't know. I, I would want, that's how I would want someone. It's so much easier to relate to someone. You get it all out front, you know, yeah, like, like this is who I am. Th- we share so much that if, like, who am I doing it for? Like, oh, I want someone that is so great on paper, but I'm not great on paper. And that's, that's when it's real. Like, where it's, you know, if you want it to be a real relationship, I mean, I've gone out, I did go out with other guys before and I it it just wasn't. Yeah. It's and just to embrace the reality that no one exists on paper. Yeah. Like that's right. just a f- that's and a, it's like it's no like super, one really will real. work. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if, if there's a challenge. Everyone has challenges, but some are bigger than others. And I just think that if you could be honest with yourself and and know what would work for you and even if it's you know it, it's like don't don't make it all pretty on the outside but do what's gonna be real for you mm-hmm. I f- what i find interesting is when you had gotten married to to alti it's an alter we know we knew we knew him as alti i know uh, he he was in your <laughs> like with in the office he was he was by know. my brother a lot right. in the office <laughs> and happens to be he was in my apartment um, he was by a Super Bowl party. That the was night, the night the before. Night before that. Oh the night wow! Before I it, didn't know he was by you. Yeah, he oh. drank a lot, but I don't think that had anything to do with it. No, he didn't. <laughs> I know, but it's funny, you know. There, I had this one story with Alter, and those who who don't know, Al- Alti was four foot something. He he had from the from the minute he was born, he had these complications. He his hands were blue from bl- bad uh, you know oxygenation of his blood and. He had issues, kidneys, every medical thing, and he embraced it and he loved it, and, and, and boy did he milk it sometimes. But I remember on Purim, I was uh, I was driving a Woodmere, and I wasn't drinking, but he was, and um, <laughs> he did that well, which people didn't realize that he could drink because here's this, you know, and he he could just <laughs> he could knock it. There back. was always a reason to drink. <laughs> like we're alive, l'chaim. It's amazing. L'chaim. But Alti was he was Correct. there in Woodmere. And he asked me, could you give me a ride? I'm like, sure, like hop in. So it was me and my brother in the car and, and Alter gets in and he's like, okay, go on to Peninsula Boulevard. So I go off one of these side streets in Woodmere. I make a left onto Main Street, Peninsula Boulevard. He's like, okay, make a left here. Make a left. He's like, okay, right over there. And I drop him off. And I realized that I dropped him off two houses from where I picked him up. <laughs> And like he was just He took you for a ride. But he was so wasted. <laughs> he didn't even realize that he took I think me, he was messing with you or not. I think so too. Like he was he just like took me on the peninsula. Like I don't know if he realized, but like Oh he realized. <laughs> like like it was he amazing. T- he told the story many times after that. He did. He's like I took him all the way around. 
but but it's so funny because you mentioned like you know and i speak to people who are close to alti um he just he he lived on borrowed time and so did you at that point he made the most of every single second and what i found he taught me a lot but the most was his confidence i could not get over because i was always self-conscious I think because I was hiding something and it's like, oh, are they going to see? But I was like, oh, but people stare at you. He's like, so? That's their problem. And he walked around like everyone else and I was amazed by that. So he taught me that I could do that too. It's amazing. He was a fierce guy. He was. Yeah. I sat next to Yom Kippur a few times and there was one year Yom Kippur where uh, during the break, we went. I went to my brother's apartment on Herrick, and Aldi came. And we were just like, we're so hungry. And he's just like, I just had a really good lunch. <laughs> like, because, you know, he wasn't fasting. He knew, right, he knew how to. And he was just rubbing it in our face. <laughs> and it, it was just. It was yeah, just, but like he had a charm. Like, yeah. Yeah. Really, really special. So, what, you know, again, like you, you never really thought that. You, you know, it was in the cards for you. You, you. Like you said, Hashem did enough for me. You know, this is good. But here comes Alti, and it's you and Alti just taking on the world. What What was that like? Well, he, he really, his favorite thing in the world was just being my husband. Like, this is my wife. He would always just go around with me. This is my wife. And he loved that he was able to do that. And that was like his number one thing. And... I think like he just always wanted to be able to say that he has a wife and he was so proud and obviously I was so lucky to he in those years we were married he gave me so much and like I didn't think I could ever be that happy wow but he he was he had a very different approach growing up with medical things and he was never he was never worried um i I think there's a good balance but um he really like in the end we figured out a great balance because i'm more of a worrier and he's always like it's okay like it will work out and we figured out how to you know how to do it with the with the two of us and we actually went to each other's transplant doctors to like it's always nice to go back like, and say like Hakara yeah, Satov right. and like look what happened to me and they were so excited when I and, and then he wanted me to, to go to Toronto to his hospital and like it was just so nice that we both had a transplant hospital you know yeah wow. that's that's so amazing <laughs> that's incredible he sounded like he was a real free spirit very. He took me to so many places. Like, we flew to L.A. to for Shavuos one year. You know, I'm from L.A. Yeah, way. so his aunt lives there. And then while we're in L.A., he's like, we're going to San Diego. I we, There's a train. And if people saw him, they would be like, how does he get anywhere? He went to more places than, than like, he didn't drive, but he still managed to get anywhere. Like, he gets rides. Yeah. And, like, also, he knew, like... <laughs> He was not embarrassed to ask people things if he needed it. And he was really like, it's not a bad thing to ask. And he took trains. And, like, he went all over the city when he, he went to work in the morning. But, like, during the day, he would do errands that I, so I wouldn't have to do them. He would take subways, carry it home in his knapsack. And whenever we were traveling, it was just like, we're here. Like, let's make the most of it. There's so much to do. And he really, like, he taught me how to live. I was I was alive, and I did my part to make, you know, it's, I'm alive now, and I have a second chance, but he really taught me he how to that live life. Something that I, that I saw that is sort of was your guy's thing was two hearts, two lungs, one soul. Right. I think it's going to be the title of this episode. It's two hearts, two lungs, and one soul. Wow. It's almost like you guys are just, like, made for each other. Right, so that's why it was very hard. Uh, the next part, I think, yeah. um, was like we were just so balanced out. 
In the beginning, I th- I thought like we were a seesaw. Like there was always one of us who was having a medical issue, and then we kind of balanced. Probably like three to four years into the marriage, and then right, like right after that, it all fell apart. And um, Alter called me from work, and he's like, "Oh, I fell, but." I'm okay. It was always that I'm okay. Like mm. they were, you know, um, they're they're just taking me in to make sure I'm okay. And I was like, oh, so I could pick you up tonight? And he's like, yeah. Um, that did not happen, and his heart had stopped. But they didn't realize because he fell somewhere and were at work, and he walked back upstairs, and he was bleeding. But they didn't really know what happened. And then it happened again at the hospital. So then they figured out it was a heart issue. And he was on his, at this point, his second heart already. Right. So his family all lived in Israel. My mother-in-law flew in, and they said he needs a pacemaker. There was a complication with a pacemaker. This was over like three days. It was very fast. Um, And then his kidney shut down. Mm -hmm. Like I went in already... Two, three days after he fell and like they weren't sure he was going to make it and he ended up one thing after the other but he needed dialysis and that kind of destroyed him it was I think he also was because he was able to live life like so full and then being on dialysis it just he didn't have any way to, you know, that there was no energy left. And he had to be attached to it 10 hours a day. And he didn't feel well ever. And it, it affects his mood. And and also I think the, the hardest part for him was that he couldn't be the husband that he was. And, like, we just loved, we you know, we fell into this role and, and how everything worked for us. And it was just, like like they say, perfect harmony. And then when he could no longer do that, like all he wanted to do was come home and he was in the hospital so long. And then he went to Minnesota and he's like, I'm going to get better. Uh, Every single time we spoke, he's like, don't worry, I'm coming home. Like he didn't want me to give up on that, that he's going to come home and take care of me. And obviously like, I knew, like, things were not going very well. This was actually a long time. This was over two, two, three years. That I think it was two full years. Right. Whew, it must have been a lot for you to deal with at that time. So I actually, that was when I became the person on the other side of the bed. I was so used to being a patient but I think in a way it's worse to be on the other side. Really? Because when you're, I mean, from someone who was a patient a lot, I think like you figure out what, what helps you and it's, it's a different, like, it's out of your control, it always is. But this is watching someone and feeling helpless. Mm. When it's just me, it's like just, this was, watch like he's in pain and then I'm in pain from watching him and being in pain and it's it's like this suffering that I didn't know after having physical pain I you know it's just to watch and he never ever complained about anything even if I saw it on his face he would never complain wow you know it it came to a point though where I think Alti sort of knew it himself that the writing was on the wall, things weren't going well, and you as well, you know, were in the loop of of that was happening. Those, I guess, final weeks and and months with you know with Alti still here. What was what was that like? So he had um, during COVID, he was flown. He was actually went to Israel to be with my in laws because. It was physically draining for me to take care of someone on dialysis right. and myself. So he was he was so upset about going and leaving me. 
But in his mind, he's like, hey, it's, it's so that I could get better. And he's going to come back. And right. And then he called me like Minnesota said they're going to work the Mayo Clinic. So he's like, I called. I found a doctor there that said they are going to um, be able to help me. What happened was he had a, a pr- problem that his wounds didn't heal properly. Like he went through so much. He had scar tissue and blood disorders so when during his pacemaker surgery his um the scar never like it never really closed so he was put on another machine and I think with each machine he went on he just felt like he was losing himself so he he was so hopeful when they said that they were gonna be able they were willing to try to fix that for him and at that point, though, there was so much infection that had went in, like inside his body from that after being open for so long. So I think it it did take him a while, just because he was holding on so much to hope. He wanted to live, right? Like he he just said, like I'm I'm gonna come home. So he went to Minnesota during COVID. I wasn't allowed to go. First of all, as a transplant patient, right? My doctors don't want me in hospitals just because I'm immunocompromised. So, you know, just not to be around germs. Right. But also, they wouldn't have allowed me to because no one was having visitors. I hadn't seen him for a very long time, so at that point, I was happy to not see him in such a bad police because this way I just had good memories Mm -hmm. um obviously like deep like I didn't know where it was headed but not I wasn't really given so many like yeah like details but um just because he had he hadn't been with me for so long as I heard you describe the relationship that you had with him it's you know, it's palpable in the room here how the love between the two of you was so alive. And I would invite you to what message do you have for couples that might be listening to this and maybe are getting lost in the hecticity of the minutia of everyday life? So he had, I think it was the day that he was by you. And we had like, we're, this is also like we we were doing over a bathroom, which is like the first project that we were doing together. <laughs> and he was so into it. And we we went to Lowe's that day. Like it was very exciting. That's, that's a trip. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember like I said something like, about, you know, obviously you always regret saying these dumb things, but about like the faucet or something. And he said, Rifki, we're healthy. And just don't worry about it. The, all these things are just things. And the next day he fell. Yeah. And I, I was I was like, I can't believe that was probably the last thing I said because it was the Super Bowl. And yeah. I went and I'm like, I'm not waiting up for you. You're gonna be up. Sorry, he's and, he was with me. <laughs> and he went to work at seven thirty. Right. So I was like, you know, and those words were so powerful. That really is all things, and to just be grateful for the chance to have someone to share your time with. And yeah, it gets overlooked with the regular every day, but that things could change in a, in a minute. So just to focus on the, the more important things, and the little things will just resolve. It's a deep message. Yeah. It's really amazing. It really, it really, really is. Um, you know, I, I, I read that Alti really fought to the end, to the very end. He tried everything, and he wanted to live very, very badly. And um, unfortunately, he was Nifter. You know, a lot of people were doubting for him, but unfortunately, he was Nifter, um, which is, it's what, two years now? Um, It was a year ago. It's a year from, ago. like, Pesach. Okay. But and yeah, my, my mother-in-law said that the doctor said to him, like, 
should we do like like should we go till the end and then then when like there's really and he's like yeah like i don't care if it's you're you know he was he took anything like he was such a high tolerance for pain so he was like you know try again try again whatever you have to do that's really amazing and when i was talking to you i mentioned something interesting after he had passed away um it was a very sad time but there also was a time where chalitza had to be done yes which is rare right it's 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 like it is rare because they have to have an older brother Mm -hmm. and they and no kids so i really didn't know what it was and i did not think it was as awkward as it would be. <laughs> they say Felice is pretty awkward. I knew it was something with a shoe. <laughs> What's that? I knew it was something with a shoe. Right. But um, I was very surprised by... Um, so I, I show up the night... My brother-in-law had to fly in from Israel. It does not matter if he's married. He had um, six kids then. And his wife, and they came in... And he was very excited about this. <laughs> it's, a, it's an opportunity <laughs> to, to a mitzvah yes. that is not usually done. Um, yes. But it's it's a m- very embarrassing for me. Um, but I, I like this is something I could do. The last thing I could do for him. So I we don't sh- have to talk about it if oh if it's you okay prefer that as well. I think it's a very no one knows what like what goes on. So this is a scoop. <laughs> Um, I I showed up the night before. I had actually learned with Rabbi Cern, the halachos. I had a very hard, like when he told me what I would have to do. I was a little bit like, but it seems so weird. And like the emotional part is like, why is this what we have to do for like for up there? So it's, I had to remove his shoe but there's very intricate halachos. Like with one hand, I had to, um, it's also a very old, it's not really a shoe, it's a leather sandal that has all these clasps. So I had to take them off, then throw it, and I had to spit at him. But the like the, all the rabbanim are, there's a whole basin and they have to watch me. But then I found out that I also have to be fasting. And it's very hard when everybody's watching because there was an audience there. And it's it was probably one of the hardest things that I had to do. Wow. In a different way, but yeah. just the, there's so much pressure. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a halachic thing. Like, I can't do it wrong. Right. But there was a positive to it that because it was an embarrassment... I was able to give brachos. Wow. So everyone lined up afterwards. And even the chalitza rub, and they all gave me names to say a bracha for. And, um, well, I don't know how long that lasts, but no, I, just will for ask, then. I will ask you for a bracha right now. Yes. <laughs> oh, on camera. Right here. <laughs> you should have a lot of success in everything you do and a lot of nachas from your children and show them bias and just live a long happy life amen and we should see mashiach very soon amen amen, amen. Rifki, this is this is your episode this is sort of your message to the world is there anything that you want to share with the so people listening because it's almost rosh hashanah um i do want to say something that i came across so, um while i was recovering in pittsburgh um, it was Yom Kippur, and I was there for both, but I felt very like, okay, I, it didn't feel Yom Kippur to me, because it was a regular hospital day, so I decided to open up a machter, and like, I was, it was very hard for me to to do much, because I, I was on a lot of medication, I was like, I'm going to try to say one thing, so I said Unasana Tokef, and I will never look at it the same way because when I read the words mi yachia u mi amas, I was so emotional because you see how everything is so orchestrated from Hashem because I said who had to die so that I could live. 
Wow. And now every year it's it's a different tefila. Like it means so much more. But I think that the one message that I would want to leave off with is no one should have to lose so much to be grateful for what they have. That's really beautiful. That it is. really is. I want to thank you so much for coming in tonight and for sharing your story. Being vulnerable. Yeah. And we're going to normalize that on those shit resumes. Start putting the f- start putting those things on the resumes, people. Rifki, thank you so much. And thank you yeah. so much. And this is, um, I want to publicly, as a thank you to Hashem, that this Matzei Shabbos and is the thirteenth long anniversary. Nice. <laughs> and um, it's it's such a bracha to be able to go from that person. In Boston, who I was like, no one knows me, and I'm gonna like, I don't want to leave this world without people even knowing I was here to being on this podcast. So thank you so much for so amazing because you know it wasn't me that opportunity. And it wasn't even like planned like that. I reached I reached out to you and you and and we were going back and forth with with dates and we picked this you know the, to record it. And it's Wednesday night. We're putting out this episode with Shabbos, and you're like. That's the Matzei Shabbos that I got it's my... It's the long anniversary. It's the long anniversary. <laughs> That's amazing. Merit Hashem, people should be listening to this and going into Slichos. And we're very happy that you're you're here and you're healthy. And many, many more years. Amen. Amen. What an episode. You know, Rifki wow. Morel. Wow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rifki Morel, now you know. Now you know Standing who she o. is. Stand, Standing O. Standing ovation for her. That was some episode, really. What an incredible human being. And it should be really for the success of the Neshama of Alti, Alta Morel. Yes, indeed. Uh, fought hard, and, and Bezalel will all be reunited very, very soon. But those post it notes, though, I don't know. All I'm saying is maybe. Soon as, by the way, as soon as the cameras went down, Nahi pledged to Rifki that he's going to have meaningful minute people. Post it. Yeah. Meaningful po- people, meaningful minute post it notes. So you just gotta stay. You gotta stay. Stay tuned to meaningfulminute.org because if we're gonna make these post-it notes that you can have in your life, that you're gonna do what Rifki did, then we're gonna we're gonna put them there. Uh, so stay so tuned. Hayward. So St- stay tuned. Um, we appreciate you listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure to just share it. Say hey, copy that link, whether it's on YouTube or make Spotify. Make that sound with your mouth also. That Nahi made. Yep. Right there. Copy that link and just shoot it out to people. Um, if you're still listening in this part of the episode, just leave a review because we have a special bond then. All right? Adios, guys. Shout out to Cody for leaving a review, by the way. Cody. Yeah, I, I remember I said last episode. Yeah, and Zach. Us sitting around. No, so Zach's a fake name. Oh. Cody's a real guy. You know, like Zach and Cody? And he, Cody said he listened to the episode and he gave us a review. So thank you, Cody. And he didn't get my reference at all. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>